Good morning. We're going to be reading the very last chapter of Farmer Boy today. Um, so in your own books, if you're following along, it starts on page 362, and it's just called Farmer Boy. Uh, this book has been so wonderful to teach lessons about hard work um, and to learn about what farm life is like. Um, Almanzo, I think, has really done a great job of enjoying his work showing that um, every dollar is worth a lot because he's learning the hard work that goes into the money that you make. So you need to be really careful with the way you spend it. Um, so there's been just a lot of good lessons that can be applied to anybody, um, no matter what kind of work you're in and no matter how old you are. So let's start reading chapter 29, which is called Farmer Boy. We will finish hearing what happened on that day that Almanzo, um, he got the $200 um, from that pocketbook that he found. Um, he was given it. Okay, so Farmer Boy. Mr. Paddock met Almanzo and Father outside the bank. He told Father that he had something in mind. I've been meaning to speak about it for some little time, he said, about this boy of yours. Almanzo was surprised. Do you ever think of making a wheel ride out of him? Mr. Paddock asked. Well, no, Father answered slowly. I can't say as I've, I ever did. Remember that Mr. Paddock makes wagons. So he's asking, would Almanzo possibly want to work um, as like a wagon maker and a wheel maker? Well, think it over time, over now, said Mr. Paddock. It's a growing business, Wilder. The country's growing, population getting bigger all the time, and folks have to get, have got to have wagons and buggies. They've got to travel back and forth. The railroads don't hurt us. We're getting more customers all the time. It's a good opening for a smart young fellow. Yes, father said. I've got no sons of mine and you've got two, said Mr. Paddock. You'll have to think about starting Almanzo out in life before long. Apprentice him to me. An apprentice, apprentice is somebody who um, works by following along with somebody much older to see the way that they do the work. An apprentice does some of the work themselves, but mainly they're just watching and learning how to do something. Um, he says, apprentice him to me and I'll treat the boy right. If he turns out the way I expect, no reason he shouldn't have the business in time. He'd be a rich man with maybe half a hundred workmen under him. It's worth thinking about. Yes, father said. Yes, it's worth thinking about. I appreciate what you've said, Paddock. It would be a good job. He'd have 50 people working for him eventually. Father did not talk on the whole way home. Almanzo sat beside him in the wagon seat and did not say anything either. So much had happened that he thought about it all together, all mixed up. He thought of the cashier's inky fingers and of Mr. Thompson's thin mouth screwed down at the corners, and of Mr. Paddock's fists in the busy, warm, cheerful wagon shop. He thought if he was Mr. Paddock's apprentice, he wouldn't have to go to school. He had often envied Mr. Paddock's workmen. Their work was fascinating. The thin, long shavings curled away from the keen edges of the plains. They stroked the smooth wood with their fingers. Almanza liked to do that too. He would like to spread on paint with the wide paintbrush, he would like to make fine straight lines with the tiny pointed brush. When the bag buggy was done, all shining in its new paint, or when a wagon was finished, every piece, good sound hickory or oak, with the wheels painted red and the box painted green, and a little picture painted on the tailboard, the workmen were proud. They made wagons as sturdy as father's bobsleds and far more beautiful. Then Almanzo felt the small stiff bank book in his pocket, and he thought about a cult. Remember, that's what he wanted to buy. He wanted a colt with slender legs and a large, and large, gentle, wondering eyes, like starlights. He wanted to teach the little colt everything, as he had taught Star and Bright. So Father and Almanza rode all the way home, not saying anything. The air was still and cold, and all the trees were like black lines drawn on the snow in the sky. It was chore time when they got home. Almanzo helped to do the chores, but he wasted some time looking at Starlight. He stroked the soft, soft, velvety nose, and he ran his finger um, along the firm curve of Starlight's little neck, under the mane. 
Starlight nippled with soft lips along his sleeve. Son, where be you? Father called, and Almanza ran guiltily to his milk can. At supper time, he sat steadily eating while mother talked about what had happened. She said that never in her life, she said you could have knocked her over with a feather, and she didn't know why it was so hard to get out um, all of it out of father. Father answered her questions, but like Almanzo, he was busy eating. At last, mother asked him, James, what is on your mind? Then father told her that Mr. Paddock wanted to take Almanzo as an apprentice. So he's staying quiet, maybe because he doesn't want it to be true. He doesn't want his little boy to leave. Now mother's brown eyes snapped and her cheeks turned as red as her wool dress. She laid down her knife and fork. I have never heard of such a thing, she said. Well, the sooner Mr. Paddock gets that out of his head, the better. I hope you gave him a piece of your mind. Why on earth, I'd like to know, should Almanzo live in town at the beck and call of every Tom, Dick, and Harry? It means just everybody can tell him what to do. And he's still a little boy. Paddock makes good money, said father. I guess if truth were told, he banks more money every year than I do. He looks on it as a good opening for the boy. Well, mother snapped. She was all ruffled like an angry hen. A pretty past the world's coming to if any man thinks it's a step up in the world to leave a farm and go to town. How does Mr. Paddock make his money if it isn't catering to us? I guess if he didn't make wagons to suit farmers, he wouldn't last long. She's feeling like this situation is saying that farm life isn't as good as town life, which offends her. Well, that's true enough, said father, but there's no but about it, mother said. Oh, it's bad enough to see Royal come down to being nothing but a storekeeper. Maybe he'll make money, but he'll never be the man that you are. Truckling to other people um, for his living all his days, he'll never be able to call his soul his own. For a minute, Almanza wondered if mother was going to cry. There, there, father said sadly. Don't take it too much to heart. Maybe it's all for the best and he said, somehow. I won't have Almanzo going the same way, mother cried. I won't have it, you hear me? Remember that Royal is thinking about this way. So it makes her emotional to think that another son of hers would um, be a townsperson and not work the farm, which is what they've always done. I feel the same way you do, said father. But the boy will have to decide. We can keep him here on the farm by law till he's 21, but it won't do any good if he wants to go. No, if Almanza feels the way that Royal does, we better apprentice him to Paddock while he's still young enough. Almanza went on eating. He was listening, but he was tasting the good taste of roast pork and applesauce in every corner of his mouth. He took a long, cold drink of milk, and then he sighed and tucked his napkin in farther, and he reached for his pumpkin pie. There he is with his feast. He cut off the quivering point of golden brown pumpkin, dark with spices and sugar. It melted on his tongue and all his mouth and nose were spicy. He's too young to know his own mind, mother objected. Almanza took another big mouthful of pie. He could not speak till he was spoken to but he thought to himself that he was old enough to know that he'd rather be like father than Mr. Paddock. He did not want to be like Mr. Paddock even. Mr. Paddock um, had to please a mean man like Mr. Thompson or lose the sale of a wagon. Father was free and independent. If he went out of his way to please anybody, it was just because he wanted to. Suddenly he realized that father had spoken to him. He swallowed and almost choked on his pie. Yes, father, he said. Father was looking solemn. Son, he said, you heard what Mr. Paddock said about you being apprentice to him? Yes, father. What do you say about it? Almanza didn't exactly know what to say. He hadn't supposed he could say anything. He would have to do whatever father said. Well, son, you think about it, said father. 
I want you should make up your own mind. With Paddock, you'd have an easy life in some ways. You wouldn't be out in all kinds of weather. Cold wintry nights, you could lie snug in bed and not worry about young stock freezing. Rain or shine, wind or, uh, wind or snow, you'd be under shelter. You'd be shut up inside walls. Likely, you'd always have plenty to eat and wear and money in the bank. James, mother said. She's mad because it makes it sound good. But that's the truth and we must be fair about it, father answered. But there's the other side too, Almanzo. You would have to depend on other folks, son in town. Everything you got, you'd get from other folks. A farmer depends on himself and the land and the weather. If you're a farmer, you raise what you eat. You raise what you wear and you keep warm with wood out of your own timber. You work hard, but you work as you please and no man can tell you to go or come. You'll be free and independent, son, on a farm. Almanza squirmed. Father was looking at him too hard. And so was mother. Almanza did not want to live inside walls and please people he didn't like and never have horses and cows and fields. He wanted to be just like father, but he didn't want to say so. You take your time, son. Think it over, father said. You make up your mind what you want. Father, Almanzo exclaimed. Yes, son. Can I, can I really tell you what I want? Yes, son, his father encouraged him. I want a cult, Almanzo said. Could I buy a cult all my own with some of that $200 and would you let me break him? Father's beard slowly widened to a smile. He put down his napkin and leaned back in his chair and looked at mother. Then he turned to Almanzo and said, son, you leave that money in the bank. Almanzo felt everything sinking down inside him, thinking he can't have his horse. And then suddenly the whole world was a great shining, expanding glow of warm light. For father went on. If it's a cult that you want, I will give you starlight. Father, Almanzo gasped, for my very own? Yes, son, you can break him and drive him. And when he's a four-year-old, you can sell him or keep him just as you want. We'll take him out on a rope first thing tomorrow morning and you can begin to gentle him. That's the end. So Almanzo basically chose that he is going to stay a farmer. That's how he wants to spend the rest of his life. Um, okay, that's the end of the book. I have really enjoyed this one. If you have too, you can read some of the other books in the Little House series. I know those of you who are at our school in second grade read Little House in the Big Woods, but we just read Farmer Boy and there's Little House on the Prairie, On the Banks of Plum Creek by the Shores of Silver Lake, the long winter little town on the prairie, these happy golden years in the first four years. It's not until the last books that Almanzo and Laura end up meeting and marrying. Um, in the early ones, most of these follow just Laura, um, along with Little House in the Big Woods, as you know, if you've read that one. Okay, well, that is the end of our story. Um, I uh, have really enjoyed this one and teaching you all literature in general. Um, we've read Princess and the Goblin and Black Beauty. Um, and we've read about the stories of Aladdin. It's been wonderful. We would have also read Jungle Book, but um, things slowed down quite a bit um, because we're doing things virtually. But that's all for today. I'll talk to you all later. Bye.